طيب وي ار لايف بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما آمين 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 برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته All praise and thanks to you, sorry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Choices, peace, blessings and salutations upon our master and exemplar Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum I welcome you to the second class uh, Marriage, divorce and family law And the booklets that, that are going around um, Sorry for those online But this is only for those who are in the class uh, The ladies upstairs should also get Quick uh, sound will, will probably distribute it there as well This is just um, a book that I always recommend Daily Adhkar It's like Fortress of a Muslim it's a basic compilation of adhkar and um, du'as, such as morning and evening du'as, du'as of different occasions, and it's very well laid out. It's f complete color, and it's pocket-sized. So it's a really great book. Um, I've been recommending it for a while, and then recently um, I had received a box of it for distribution. So it's absolutely free of charge. For those of you who are following online, you can collect a copy here at the Masjid, inshallah, either next week or on Friday. Or alternatively, if you wish, you could download uh, the copy for free online as well. Um, it's, let's see. I suppose you could just Google daily adhkar, um, and if you get a booklet that looks like that, this is a very small one, then you're welcome to download it there. Yes, Ahmed, everything okay? No, I'm okay for, with that for now. It's, it's a bit too much for me to control. So I'm just going to stick with my text here in front, if that's okay. طيب. Khair, so just for some revision, inshallah, we said that there are different rulings pertaining to marriage, right? And in relation to the different rulings, who should get married and who should not? Afwan. I'll just quickly go through what we discussed so that everybody can be on the same page. A person who needs to get married because of desire for intimacy and has enough money to uh, support a family, of course that's the male's responsibility, then it is desirable for that person to get married. And what is enough money? For the bride's marriage payment, the uh, the nafaka, clothing for the season, food for the day, shelter for the day as well. Very, very minimum standards. Now, this needs to be contextualized, right? The bare minimum is not, is not, uh, is not going to be applicable across the board. It's, it depends on the, I don't, I don't want to use the word class, but it depends on the economic standing of the family that you wish to betroth, right? You have to give them what they are accustomed to unless, of course, they agree to a more simple way of life. So that's fine. If, they, if a person does not have enough money or support to get married, then it is recommended that they don't get married. It would be regarded as offensive for them to get married, right? Especially if a person is busy with ibadah or pursuit of sacred knowledge or they are a student seeking knowledge, so their the time is being occupied by something that is beneficial. That sums it up. There are different rulings, as we said, but we can't have the same lesson repeated again. So uh, that was just some revision. Now we move on in tonight's lesson, inshallah ta'ala. And we are looking at the desirable qualities in a spouse. Right, so for the purposes of those online, I've got something to share with you. I suppose we could show it onto the screen as well. So 
Yeah, let's just share this. Last week we had some uh, gremlins in our system here. Yeah? notes on the rulings on uh, who should get married and who shouldn't but tonight we move on and we ask are you ready for marriage what are the what are the qualifications that somebody would need to have um, this is a self-assessment or an assessment that happens internally within a family your son your daughter or yourself you are interested in getting married so if a person says they are interested in getting married what should they be able to do? What type of knowledge should they have? We're not talking about uh, economic readiness. We're just speaking about within themselves. So the first and most important requirement is that the person know the basics of Dean. What are the basics of Dean? Now, depending on who you ask, this is going to differ. But as far as I'm concerned, the basics of Dean is that the person should know how to clean themselves properly, kitab tahara at least at the basic degree, and they should know how to pray, right? And they should know how to do the basics of the other five pillars of Islam, fasting, paying zakah, etc. This also differs from family to family. So if, if you are a student of deen, then the standard of knowledge is also going to be a bit higher, right? It's not, it's not going to be... It's not going to be a fun ride if the wife, for example, is an alima. She's a qualified student of deen. She, she went through a course of learning and she's highly educated. And she gets married to a man who barely knows how to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. If she's fine with that, if she's satisfied with that, so be it. But there's going to be issues down the line because one partner is going to have a standard of living based on the sharia that they expect is just... It's just natural. Everybody lives according to that. But the reality is, the other partner isn't necessarily on the same page. But more than the knowledge, the two, the two main requirements that I would say any parent needs to place front and center is the practice of deen and good akhlaq. The practice of deen and good akhlaq. Practice of deen, for the most part, is going to be that the person prioritizes praying five times a day. Right? If there's any situation wherein a person would not prioritize their salah, that's a red flag. Because if you can put Allah as a, you know, as a, as an afterthought, and that's the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then naturally anyone else's rights is not going to be given preference or precedence in that person's life. So how can you put your wife first if you couldn't manage to put Allah first? How are you going to put your husband first if you couldn't manage to put Allah first? So the first quality that you're going to look for, with, whether it is the person interested in getting married or the person who you are interested in, if they don't fulfill that requirement, you are looking for trouble. Taib? Um, there are various ways to, to test this and to acknowledge this, but we need to be very practical in our day and age. I would actually go as far as recommending that investigations take place at a very subtle level. So if somebody were to ask my daughter's hand in marriage, I would want to know at which, at which masjid does this person live? You know, what's the closest masjid? Do they ever frequent that masjid? Does the local imam know the person? Do they attend any classes there, right? And then, uh, for the most part, when it comes to more intimate meetings, you know, where they're actually now sitting down and speaking about nikah, it would be, it would be very important to see a practical demonstration of this person's deen and their practice of deen. How? It's very simple. If you go out as a family and this person is coming along as, um, as a 
as a meeting, as a guest, right? So it's, it's part of the meeting family process. And it comes to the time of salah, this person should have a concern for salah. They should at least show that, you know, the, it's time for, for the waqt now. So there are various ways of testing it. Another modern means is social media. I would run to social media from the very get-go. If anybody ever wants to know about if your daughter or your son wants to get married and you want to know the person, Google them. <laughs> Google them, right? Go and see. And it's not just about you know, looking for obvious things, like the person's in a club and they have a, uh, a glass of liquor in their, wine, in, in their hand, some wine in their hand. Um, it's not just the obvious things, it's sometimes the less obvious things. Read the posts that they write. Right? Look at the photos that they post. It shows a lot about the person. Okay? Uh, it sounds very judgy. That's exactly what is required when it comes to nikah. Taib. Just recently, um, someone asked my wife, again, I said this last week, I'm saying it again this week, and I think it's going to get me into a lot of trouble, but a lot of people come to myself and my wife, and they say, look, um, I'm interested in getting married. You know, look out for me. So there's like a long list of people. Um, so the one, the, one, of the recent, one of the recent candidates someone recommended that this person contact my wife. So they did. So I showed, I showed uh, this person's Facebook profile. And immediately we had to, we had to let go of the, of the candidate. We, we had to, look, we can't really help you. Um, the type of people who generally come to us would be people who are conscious of their deeny responsibilities and they want that in their partner. So. If you're out clubbing and you, you know, <laughs> you're living the life, you're looking in the wrong place. Right? You're, looking, you're looking in the wrong place. There's, there's a clear distinction between that and somebody who has a past. Right? If somebody has a past, they did haram in their lives and they lived a bad lifestyle, but it's in the past. Not like, you know, my teacher, Rahimahullah, used to catch the students smoking on madrasa. And then he would tell them, so and so, are you still smoking? I said, no, Molina, I quit. When did you quit? This morning, Molina. <laughs> so not that type of past. Genuinely in the past, like this person five years ago, ten years ago, they had a certain type of lifestyle. But since then, they've turned things around. When somebody makes tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a genuine tawbah, then we don't judge them for what they did in their past because we all make mistakes and we all had some or have some uh, skeletons in our closet. That said, if a wali comes to discover something about a person's past that makes that wali uncomfortable with the person, it's the wali's full right to deny the person based on their past, right? Because look, you, Fulan, you had a past, you used to drink, you used to go clubbing, and you were known to be a drinker and a club hopper, right? So you've got that reputation. You made tawbah, you turn to Allah. Masha Allah, alhamdulillah, may Allah bless you. Great stuff. I am responsible for my daughter, and I am not going to uh, put my daughter into that type of a risky situation. Perhaps somebody else would. Am I wrong for doing so? Remember, this is not a judgment on the person that because of your past you're never going to succeed. This is your responsibility as a wali, which should also teach the boys especially because this is a common thing, that you need to think beyond where you are right now in your life. You're 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years of age, and you think, I'm young, and I can just do whatever I want to, and then one day when I come right, and then I'm going to change my life, and I'm going to get married to a mu'alima. Um, if that's what you want, you need to be that. Because even Allah speaks about this in the Quran in a very interesting way. The pure ones are for the pure ones, right? The verse is very detailed in that regard. So if you, if you live a wayward lifestyle, you can make tawbah and you can come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if Allah covers your sin and you manage to escape from that life, it's not, it's not a thing that should haunt you. But if it does come up and you are refused because of that and the wali decides, look, Based on your past, I'm not going to uh, take this chance. It's his right to do so. It's his right to do so. Avoiding major sins. 
some, some people can become very pedantic when it comes to who's going to marry their children, right? And this is fine. A level of scrutiny is necessary. But you also have to remember that your child, no matter how amazing they are, they are human. They are human. And being part of the human race, every single child of Adam makes mistakes. We commit sin. But the best of those who commit sin are those who, who repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What you are looking for is not a perfect individual. It does not exist. What you are looking for is a person who avoids major sin. Right? Obvious sin. And sometimes the signs of sinning is apparent on a person. Meaning, if somebody comes in with a haircut that is, for example, synonymous with a certain type of lifestyle, that person shouldn't then tell the wali, don't judge me based on my hair. You shouldn't have a haircut like that, then nobody's going to judge you, right? You come in with a tattoo here, and you're exposing it, and it's open, and you've got earrings here, and you're wearing clothes in a certain way. This is, this is judgment. This is the responsibility of the wali. There's no way around it. On the other hand, a person comes uh, to propose and then you start looking at every single thing. Oh, the pants isn't above the ankles and there's no kufia. Um, and why is he wearing that type of cologne? That type of cologne has alcohol in it. You know, you can get very pedantic about this. And you can do that by all means and your child will be alone forever. Um, so look for avoidance of major sins. Right? That's very important. Um, if the person makes salah five times a day, always prioritizes that and avoids major sins in this day and age, get them married as soon as possible <laughs> because the catch is, is going to leave. Right? The catch is going to leave. The person, this is enough for males, right? Ideally, a male should be financially independent. Now, financial independence in, in the area that we are living in doesn't mean that they have their own house, their own car, their own this, their own that. They could get support from their family, especially if they get married young, but they still have an income. You don't want to have a situation where the child, where it's a child, and the child has no sense of financial responsibility whatsoever. So there has to be a keen interest to become financially independent. Physically and emotionally ready. The other night uh, I was running, last night in fact, this conversation came out, and a mother, I'm not going to mention names, just said something that, look, no, my child is still very giggly, was the word. I thought, okay, mashallah. A parent would know the level of maturity of their child. Type. And if a parent can assess that this child is um, emotionally mature to get married, then that's a good thing. Sometimes a child would appear to be not emotionally ready. And this is either true or it's as a result of my girl, my boy, you know. And they will always be my girl, my boy. How can they get married? There's a difference. So if the parent isn't sure whether the child is emotionally ready or not, they should get a third party opinion. Right? Somebody who can be objective and assess the person's emotional maturity from an outsider's perspective. Ideally, an elder, a pious person, etc., who can make that call. Physically ready means the person can endure intimacy. In our society and in our culture, this isn't really a question because, generally speaking, we don't have, we don't entertain child marriages. It's, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, physically as well as emotionally, we are far less mature than people hundreds of years ago. And there's lots of evidence for this, but I don't want to go down that road right now because there's a lot to get through. The person needs to be able to prioritize marriage uh, with your time. Okay? So it's unrealistic for a person who is in the heat of their studies. Right? They're busy with their, their I don't know, their, their um, degree and they write at the end and and all of a sudden they said, no, I, I would like to get married right now. You need to be able to prioritize, look, let me finish this and then get married. That said, 
if any child, if any teenager, any man, any woman fears their chastity being jeopardized, then they should prioritize marriage before everything else. Right? They should prioritize marriage before everything else. Um, the parent's blessing is a, is a tricky one because ideally the parents and the children are on the same page. That's the ideal. But what if it's not so? In the case of the children and parents not seeing eye to eye on what should be done and what's the right thing to do, my advice is to get a third party to come in and give this thing an objective judgment call. There are many different scenarios for parents and children not seeing eye to eye. Sometimes it's parents wanting to enforce a level of deen that they didn't necessarily raise the kids with, and this creates an issue. But also quite common actually is where the children come in and they want to present a level of deen that the parents are not accustomed to. And then the parents you know, are kind of shocked and taken aback. And I'm speaking specifically about um, young men, young women saying, I would like to get married. And then the parents say, no. You don't know this person. You first have to get to know them. Basically, they're saying you should date first. That's problematic. When that happens, at this age in your life, you know, when you're having this conversation, the worst thing you can do is be at loggerheads with your parents. As soon as possible, get a third party, an objective third party that is trusted by the family to come in and make a uh, negotiation possible. Right? Sometimes, parents with the best of intentions make bad decisions. In my opinion, they are bad decisions, but they're not necessarily bad. For example, no, my daughter is studying. Right? So the daughter wants to get married, and somebody wants to get married to the daughter. But the parents say, no. Why? Because my daughter is studying. Now, I get where the parent is coming from, and I respect it. Right? Finish what you're doing, otherwise, what if you fail in this and then you know, you're going to mess up your, your career and so on and so forth. I get that. But there are many considerations that are overlooked when people take that decision so easily. Right? When your kid comes to you and says that they'd like to get married, look, they're not going to say, uh, I need to have physical intimacy. That's not the way they're going to say it. Just going to say, look, I'm at that age now, I'd like to get married, and so on. It's quite possible that they really are at risk of their chastity being at risk. And if parents are going to stand in the way of that, it's very dangerous, right? So allow the space in your family where people can openly come to you as the parent and say, out of love and trust, look, I want to get married for the sake of Allah because I want to, uh, I want to, be, I want to be good for Allah's sake. Yeah, in the best and most innocent way that you can say it. The reason why I say I think it's a mistake to insist that they need to first finish their studies is, did you first figure out why they want to get married? Did you ascertain whether there's a relationship happening here already? Because if there is, there might have been something that took place in that relationship that shouldn't have, and they want to rectify the situation. If you're going to stand in the way of that, it could be spelling disaster, right? The second part is, why is there, why is there one or the other, right? Why must it be either studies or marriage? Why can't somebody be studying and get married while they are studying? Like, what is the preventative? Why is it mutually exclusive? It's not. It's a thing that we have in our minds. Because in our minds, we built up that person's entire life. They're going to finish school, they're going to study, they're going to graduate, then they're going to get a job, I'm going to build on there at the back, then they're going to get the house there, and they're going to live down the road from us, and we're all going to live happily ever after. That's your vision. You also need to respect that your son, your daughter may have their own vision. Right? And it doesn't necessarily have to be one or the other. It can be a negotiation. There are ways and means of doing this. Uh, we can discuss that later on. Arranged marriages, 
or ar- arrangement marriages, right? It's possible. But don't close off the doors of a halal marriage when the invitation is given, right? Don't be that person um, without just cause. If you've, if you've checked everything that I'm speaking about, then bismillah, you know? <sighs> I'm going to offend some people now, and ik maaf. But the other reason why you should not uh, stand in the way of marriage in, just for the purposes of my son, my daughter is uh, studying. In more Allah conscious circles, where people try to be more of the muttaqeen, they're trying to make salah, they're trying to, they're trying to be students of Quran, students of deen, hafiz, hafidah, alim, alima, or just a very conscientious Muslim, right? In those circles, the guys get married young, especially the good ones. Am I right? Most of them, they get married quite young. In my experience, on average in our community, really good, upstanding young men get married between the ages of 19 and 25, generally speaking. Obviously, this is broad strokes, 19 and 25. What age group are they going to look for when they get married? Is it going to be 25 and up or 25 and down? Generally, it's going to be younger than they are. Again, generally speaking. So what tends to happen is within these circles of righteousness, people trying to be good, the good ones are taken at a very young age. And if you're going to be placing an unnecessary hurdle and your daughter, especially for girls, your daughter who's not going to go for boyfriends and is not going to open up herself for dating and so on and is trying to preserve her chastity and is hoping that a good man is going to come sweep her off her feet and is going to make a nikah and make a, live a good life. And you telling her, no, you're not going to get married. You're first going to study. And then she's done studying and she's now 30 years of age, 35, 40 years of age. And then she's struggling. Why? Because all the good ones that she would like to get married to or the people of that caliber, they've all been married already. Now, I'm just speaking purely from what I've seen for this last two decades, and uh, I could be proven wrong. But this is why I think it's very important to open up these doors of nikah. Whether it be through the son lives with his family, and the, you know, sorry, the, the groom lives with his family, and the wife lives with her family, and they're still building their life up together, Whatever arrangement can be made to make it work, if, it, if, if the parents can assist with that, I would, I would say, by all means, try to. Right? And Allah knows best. Then, you have a plan for your future and know where marriage fits in. Now, I don't think anyone in our community practices anything like forced marriage. There exists something like that in the Sharia. It's very restricted. Um, it's not entirely forced marriage, but it's where the wali, it's called wali mujbir. It's only for the father or for the grandfather. No one in our community, in our culture, I don't even think in our time, wallahu alam, exercises this type of right. Um, generally because it doesn't turn out well. And when it when it took place in the past, it took place only when fathers had the best interest for their sons. So this is what people refer to as an arranged marriage, right? Other than that, there is no such thing as a forced marriage in Islam. But there is such a thing as forced marriage. But it doesn't exist in Islam. It exists in what we've accepted as normal. Okay? And it's called boyfriend and girlfriend. And it's forced marriage. Let me explain. Right? So the boy meets the girl in high school. Why did he meet her? What was he looking for? Why did she meet him? What was she looking for? A husband? A father to her child? A mother to his children? A person who he can spend the rest of his life with? No. He was only looking at the attraction. That was it. So they go out. We call it going out. 
right? So maybe they go out for the rest of high school, they go out in university, but they go out, and this is haram, because they're going out, they're holding hands, they're kissing, they're doing other things, they're living a life that is not pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all, right? None of this is halal. Okay, so where's the forced marriage? Eventually, somewhere along that line, he's going to feel he wants to now get married, and she's going to feel she wants to now get married. They're only left with one option, the person that they only found attraction in, no one else. They can't get away from that relationship because it's heartbreak. They don't, if they were objective and not clouded by the lust that's over their eyes, they wouldn't choose that person as a life partner, as a spouse. It's not going to be the type of person that they imagined spending the rest of their life with. They didn't base it on this person makes salah five times a day, this person wants to go and perform hajj, this person has good akhlaq. That wasn't even a consideration. But now the discussion is all of a sudden in nikah. They have no other option but to, marry, but to marry each other. And I'm speaking only in the sense of what they see. They see it as they don't have another option. That, in my opinion, is called a forced marriage. They forced themselves into that marriage. Ideally, they should have woken up, realized, look, now I want to take my life seriously. I want to actually live according to Allah's law. So I'm going to look for a wife. I'm going to look for a husband. And with that in mind, they would choose a list of criteria. Sounds very mechanical, right? It is. I want a wife who X, Y, Z. And I want a husband who this, that, and the other. And with that in mind, they go and look for a spouse. This is not going to happen with boyfriend, girlfriend, and dating scenarios. No. It's going to be, I'm going to end up marrying this person that was nothing but a An attraction. An attraction. And the major problem with that is the attraction fades. <laughs> the attraction fades. And then they're left with what? There's no deen. Hopefully, inshallah, there's going to be a little bit of deen if they build it up after time. But it's a risk. So, the desirable qualities in a bride, the desirable qualities in a husband. And now I'm reading straight from sacred law. It is recommended to marry, for a man to marry a virgin. And similarly, that he be a virgin. It's recommended. So a person's past life does come into play. Say so if a man goes and he proposes, the family has full right to ask him, are you a virgin? Now while you never have to confess your past sins, or any sins for that matter, to anyone except Allah, you can't lie. You know what I'm saying? You can't. You can't lie, because that's not a past sin. If you lie, that's a current sin. <laughs> that's a problem. So that's a question that, uh, that should be asked. Not in the first meeting, na, Kanala. Somebody knocks on the door. Salam alaikum, Bhutan, I'm coming to see your daughter. Are you a virgin? Not like that. But it's a discussion that must come up. It's a discussion that must come up. It is permissible to marry a non-virgin. It is permissible, even if she wasn't previously married or he wasn't previously married, but that's a risk that you take. That's a risk that you take. So your son, your daughter looked after themselves, you know, kept themselves chaste, etc. Now this person who made mistakes in the past is coming and they want to, to marry. You can decide, okay, fine, are you happy with this person? Are you happy that they made Tawbah? Are you happy that they changed their life around, etc.? You can go for it, but it's a risk that you, you take willingly. Then, in classical fic literature, there's a recommendation that you should try to marry somebody who is fertile. <laughs> How are you going to know that? Allah alone knows. But the way the scholars in the past would judge this is that, uh, look at the family. Are there a family who has a lot of children? Then that's enough of a sign and go for it, bismillah. Why? Why is, that a, a, why is that a recommendation? Because of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi you know, get married, al-walud al-wadud, a loving, childbearing, uh, in, into a loving, childbearing marriage. Why? Because, inni mukathirun bikum al-umam yawm al qiyamah Because I want to brag to the other nations about you all on the day of Qiyamah. Now, the millennials and our parents, not so much. 
But their parents, Allahu Akbar, the boomers, they call them. Uncle Thabit, how many brothers and sisters did you have? Do you have, sorry? Okay, no. And, and, and before the <laughs> generation up, Uncle Ihsan, brothers and sisters? Fifteen. Yeah, Rob. My mother was also, I think, 14. My father was. So that's how it used to be. And then they made TV and internet and, <laughs> and family planning. But anyway, so that's a classical recommendation, right? If you contextualize things now, yes, ideally you should still try to have many kids. It's a good thing. But if you can't get quantity, go for quality, right? Because it's a tough time to raise a family in. And it's easy to let go of quality. What is the list of requirements according to Sharia? Number one, religiousness, which takes precedence over anything and everything else. Hy kan nilik wees. Hy kan arm wees. Maar as hy nie salah maak then it's a problem. Now, it might seem very superficial, so you're just basing this thing purely on salah. What about this? What about that? No. You see, salah is the yardstick. If this person's, if this person's um, priority with salah is apparent, then that means deen is apparent in this person's life. That's why salah is the key thing here. Other types of, of religious signs could, could be uh, considered. person has a beard, she wears hijab, you know. This all depends on, on the uh, compatibility. So you can't take a young lady, she's an alima, hafidha, wears niqab, full hijab, she wears black head to toe, face Alice all day, every day, and then you want to pair up with a guy that looks like he stepped off of a FHM cover. It's not going to work, right? He may be making salah, but it's, it's a different story. So there you start looking at compatibility. Intelligence is an important factor, right? Intelligence is an important factor. And this, this again, is about compatibility. It's not looking for the most intelligent person. It's about looking for a person that you can have a conversation with. That you can have a conversation with and you can be a good geselskap for makkah. Goeie geselskap, right? As I said at the beginning of the class, the two major qualities are religiosity, religiousness, taqwa, and good akhlaq. The Prophet ﷺ said, if a person comes to you with good character and uh, good deen, and you don't get you know, this, these people married, what's going to happen? There's going to be fitna, there's going to be a facade in the land. And you would have contributed to it. Now there's already fitna and facade in the land, let us not further contribute to it. There are other considerations as well, but these are secondary. A good family and beauty. As I said before, while beauty is a consideration, beauty fades. In my personal opinion, a person who is serious about nikah, the, the requirement that you should have is, I, I shouldn't be repelled by the person, to put it simple. This person doesn't need to, you know, make your heart skip a beat. But at the same time, you shouldn't be repelled by the person. If that is there, the love that will grow over time will make this person more and more appealing to you. if they have good akhlaq. If they don't have good akhlaq, then there's a lot at stake. Because it's not their salah that's going to treat you well. Right? Ideally, salah should lead to good character. But you get people who manage to have all the outward appearances of deen and all the outward practices of deen, but character-wise, they fail miserably. So it is important to develop both within yourself and to look for that within others as well, right? Akhlaq and deen. Those are the two most fundamental um, factors in looking for a good spouse. Now we speak about the engagement and looking at the opposite sex. So last week we had some interesting conversations outside of the masjid um, after the class. What's allowed, what is not allowed? You're not allowed to date, or are you? The problem is terminology. What do you mean by dating? Right? If what you mean by dating is 
a man and a woman meeting with permissible circumstances for the purposes that they are interested in marriage, with the objective that they are interested in marriage. They're not necessarily going to get married to each other, but they are interested in marriage. So they're coming together to meet under permissible circumstances. If you still call that a date, then that's permissible. I don't know what you want to call it, but that there is permissible. What is not permissible? What is not permissible is having a relationship that is not marriage. Right? And here, parents come up with interesting um, terminologies to, to sort of appease their consciousness. No, this is his friend. They're friends. How are they friends? No, they're just friends. They just sit in the room over weekends <laughs> together with the door closed. They just go to the bicycle together. They just go uh, to the malls together. We just go on holiday together. Come on, man. Whether you call it friend or girlfriend, that's still haram. Okay? If you are speaking about dating in the sense that a boy comes and he picks up the girl and they go for a date by themselves, that's dating that is haram. But any type of meeting where they are not alone, so there's good, trustworthy company, ideally a mahram for her, but if not a mahram for her, then within the company of others who are good and trustworthy. And the reason for them being in the same gathering together is because they are checking each other out for marriage. Even if it is coming to your house and having a family lunch or family dinner or coming to family functions or going out with the family to, I don't know, Nando's or wherever you go to, for the purposes of, you know, checking if there's compatibility here, if there's marriage, then all of that is above board and permissible, right? Although you shouldn't toy around with this either. It's not that this must now happen for two years, three years, and then see, and then, okay, no, it's still risky. So do what you need to do under permissible circumstances, and then make a decision and, and get it over with. In the past, it was a matter of, what is your intention? If you come to the, if you, if you as a male go to a lady's house more than once, and the father sees that you're there, evil wit, what are you doing here? Right? What, what's the reason for you coming? And I, I don't know what the impetus was for asking that question, but it's a very valid question. Because if you're coming here, because you're just coming to chill, Go chill somewhere else. Right? But if you're coming here because, look, I'm 18 years of age now. I'm working. I'm, I'm thinking about settling down, getting married, etc. So I'm just getting to know your daughter. But you should say, Ahlan wa sahlan, come, let's, you know, let's meet. Let's chat. You should welcome that. And then the facilities with which young men and young women should, should, uh, should engage these opportunities is all the beautiful circles of deen that we have available to us. Your local masjid, your jama'a, uh, madaris, right? When I say madaris, I mean schools of learning. You get many adult schools of learning, whether it be weekend courses or full-time courses. Approach your local alim, approach your uh, local teacher. Ask about, you know, respective people. And then very importantly is for parents to take an active role in matching up the children. So if you have a daughter who's about 15 years of age, then you should start speaking about marriage, not because you want the 15 year, 15 year old girl to get married, but because you want her to be comfortable with the topic. And more, more particularly, to be comfortable with the topic with you and not with others, right? If you have a, a boy of the similar age, that's basically with the last point at which you can become mukallaf, then you should start speaking about the changes that, if you haven't already, then you should definitely speak about the changes, the desires, all of those things, and nikah. What type of wife would you like to get married to one day? What type of husband would you like to get married to one day? These conversations are just to facilitate talk. That's it. It's not that you're encouraging them to get married. It's just so that you can open the lines of communication. Because if they're not open, trust me, they're open elsewhere. They are open elsewhere. Right? And then, eventually, when you sit down and you, you're serious about it, you can see this girl is busy with boys, and this boy is busy with girls. Now you have to become more serious. And parents should take an active role by speaking to their own close circles. Right? 
speaking to their own close circles, their own ulama, imams, schools, etc. And that would be very, very um, helpful for young men and young women. Don't make it difficult for your children to speak to you about normal things. Right? They will find a means. Once you have this conversation, facilitate meetings. Make it easy. Right? If there's boys coming over, if there's girls coming over, that's not good. But if a boy is coming over, he doesn't need to bring his daddy in the first meeting, right? He's maybe just coming over because he's going to come have lunch with the family. There might be some interest. Don't jump the gun. Some parents can, can be very quick to pull the trigger. There's a boy coming. My child's getting married next week. Sober. Maybe they don't even know if they like each other. They just want to see if, they, if there's any compatibility there, right? Be open to such, uh, to such meetings as long as you are in control of it. But understand that a man and a woman should never, ever be alone. And when I say alone, I mean alone, like doors closed or in a car somewhere or out alone. Alone doesn't mean they're sitting there in the lounge having conversation. We're sitting in the dining room and we can practically almost hear what they're saying, but not quite. That's not alone. That's sometimes necessary, right? Then we can speak about engagement and looking at the opposite sex. Here, we fail miserably. All of us. Allah forgive us. But a man should never look at a person of the opposite sex with desire and vice versa except his wife. Except his wife. Right? So if you go outside, not right now, <laughs> But if you go outside and you see, oh, there's a nice, lovely lady walking there. Can you look at her? Can you look at her and say, oh, mm, nice, oh, nice. You can't do that. It's haram. So that's in person. But what about if it's on a movie? What about if it's a video on your phone? You see why I said we all fail miserably in this? Because we live in a culture and in a society where this has become completely normalized. So when we start next week, we'll speak about looking at the opposite sex and to what extent can the groom-to-be or, or groom-wannabe one, <laughs> and, and the bride-wannabe, to what extent can they look at each other, right? Uh, how can he check her out? How can she check him out? To what extent? The Sharia is quite, uh, it's quite interesting in this regard. So for example, the guy doesn't know what she looks like for real. She's always fully covered. Now he can't tell her, can I see your hair? I just want to check, you know, what kind of hair it is. <laughs> he can't do that. But there are other ways around this, right? There are other ways that they can check each other out. Mothers and sisters should get involved. Right? Not photographs and videos. Not photographs and videos. At least not in the way that it's normally done. And Allah knows best. So there was a lot. These are still sort of the precursory discussions about how to get to the point. We haven't reached the crux of the matter yet, which is the proposal, the rules of the proposal, and what happens thereafter. But all of these are necessary, and these are sometimes the, the, the questions and the discussions that, that are the most uh, impactful when it comes to nikah, because it's a confusing thing. It, it's not a very... It's not a very obvious thing to do, especially when you're navigating the world that you're living in and the ideal world of Islam. And you have to make, you have to make do with both of them. So on the one hand, you're used to standards that people have set, society has set, culture has set. And on the other hand, you've got this deen that you want to live by and Allah's law that you want to abide by. And you want to be you know, good in both respects. And I can tell you, some of the stuff that I said tonight, you're going to find uh, ulama saying oh, that's absolutely haram, you know, because it's not very obvious. It's not very obvious as to, to, like for some people, one meeting, if they make up their mind in that one meeting, bus, you must get married after that. You can't meet the second time. Um, what I said was that, no, you can facilitate meetings so that they can see if they're actually interested in getting married. Call it a compromise? I don't think so. I think it is... It is a necessary contextualization of the laws as we have it here. And um, 
the, the society and the context that we live in without compromising the, the hard and fast of, of, of uh, Allah's law. Right? Any questions? Online or in person? Now's the time. Bismillah. You don't need to be shy. Right? Bismillah. Yes. Mm. I will repeat the question. Somebody is just busy asking a question. I don't know. That's big. That's big. One day when I'm big, I'll know. So is it is it exchangeable? The mahar is exchangeable. The wife isn't, no. Uh, so the question is: If somebody asks for a particular uh, item of maskavi mahar, can it be changed for its value? Yes, it can. Uh, the mahar is the wife's prerogative. She sets the precedent. She gives the amount. He must agree, right? Once he agrees and they get married and the marriage is consummated, it's a debt that he owes her. What she does thereafter, except for increasing it, is her prerogative. She can't come and say, look here, I know I charge you 250 when you got married, but you know, inflation, so J skilled for my 20 days and she can't do that. But she can, for example, she she told her husband, look, uh, my mahar is that I want to go on Hajj to the value of 150,000 Rand. That, by the way, is, is a common thing. No? People make hajj the mahar, but you can't do that because that's open-ended. It needs to have a specific value, right? So you can say hajj to the value of 150,000 rand. Then down the line, she says, oh, demand circle, hajj is difficult. When is he even going to get there? She could tell him, look, it's fine. Let's just settle it with uh, Umrah in Ramadan, you know, for example. So that it is possible now. Right? It's a milkah question, right? Where they, they get married and then they don't consummate the marriage. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Um, so the question is about like a speed dating type of thing. But halal, uh, halal situation facilitated by Allah conscious people, um, obviously setting the, 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 the situation. So people get to speak to each other for a certain time period, these questions and so on that they can ask and answer. Uh, sorry, otherwise if, if I don't do this, it's going to die. Okay. It's, it's permissible and I would advise that it, it is a good way to go. Especially if you're not connected, uh, if you're not well connected socially, right? So uh, some people, like I consider myself to be well connected socially. What do I mean by that? I know a lot of people and more or less a lot of people know me, right? So in that sense, if I put the word out in my circles and so on, I can easily find someone, something, some way, right? But some people are not. Maybe they live far off, they're not a very social perso uh, person, etc. But they also have needs, or their children will also have needs. How are they going to find, you know, uh, how, they, how are they going to find good people without, without much taklif, difficulty, going and uh, meeting imams and so on. So these facilities are excellent. Now, thank you for bringing that up because my dear colleague and brother, Sheikh Muhammad West, he's running something right now, actually, and he asked me to send some good people his way, and I have been doing that. Um, so I'm also just informing the Jama'ah here, if you know of young men, young women, or not so young men, young women, um, who are interested, Sheikh Muhammad West is running something currently. Um, I can send you the details, but it's, it's best you contact them directly. Sheikh Muhammad West is the Imam of the Burhanul Islam Movement, uh, Masjid in, in Burqa. It's called Muslim Singles Meet and Treat Event. 
How do you like that? <laughs> Meet and treat him. Sheikh Muhammad West comes up with very interesting names. Like he has, he has this one thing where he takes youth into a maqbara overnight. <laughs> I think that's what they do. And it's called a nightmare on Ilm Street. <laughs> Mashallah. So by all means, you know, uh, do, do consider taking this. You have to apply. They're going to take 10 males and 10 females that they will select from applications that they receive. There's no cost to register. The fee to attend the event is 300 rand, inclusive of note stationing. So it's a course also, right? Probably very similar to what we're covering here, uh, but with the objective that they're going to find suitable partners for, for one another. Right? So that's a good question. Any other questions? Yeah, this is a tough one, the Milkah story. Um, the, okay, what is a Milkah? It, it, it's not a term you're going to find in this book. Or in, in this book. It's not a book, but the book that I've opened here. Uh, it, it's somewhat of a contemporary term. So let me explain quickly what is, what is meant by it. It's the contract of Nikah without the consummation. So the boy and the girl, or the man and the woman, they get married, but they don't consummate the marriage. With the, uh, with the objective that they are going to do what dating couples do. They're going to go out together. They're going to uh, maybe have quiet time, alone time, etc. with each other. But they're not going to. They agree with one another that they're not going to consummate the marriage. So he doesn't owe her a mahar yet. And she doesn't owe him anything yet. He doesn't owe her nafaka. You know, they don't take on the responsibilities of marriage. So it's permissible. I think it's a, I think it's a, it's an option for people. I just I'm not a fan. Ah, no. So that I mean it can work, and there are circumstances that uh, that are uh, perhaps requiring such you know invention. In my opinion. Um, just get married. Just get married. And, and just do the normal thing. And if you need to live separate, then still live separate. But I, the reason I, I'm not a fan of it is because I can't imagine being in that situation. Like, I can have sexual intercourse, but I'm not. <laughs> it's nothing. Then, then it's, it's halal. But then, he owes nafaka now. Now he owes nafaka. So he must now support her as, as, as his wife. Right? Yes, that's the agreement. So, youngsters often, youngsters often try this. And then they end up just getting married normally. It's like the foot in, man. Because if you go to your parents and you tell them, look, I want to get married. That's like, huh? You know, it's a big deal. But if you go to your parents and say, look, I want to do this new thing. It's not actually marriage, but it's a like kind of marriage. It's a foot in. Once they agree, just change it on the day and say, no, sorry. <laughs> We're going to move in. I, I, I just, I'm just not a fan. Uh, it's halal. It's permissible. And it might be necessary for some people to, uh, to, to, you know, get by. Allah knows best. But I think the young man, the young woman who wants to get married... If they make an agreement that, look, we can't move in together yet. I'm still studying, you're still studying, you're still working, etc., etc. That negotiations can take place. But I feel once they are halal for one another, they should be halal for one another. Right? Um, I am very open to the idea of they don't live together just yet. Because there can be real, genuine reason for that. Okay? So facilitate for that. Is it the question? When it comes to now. Yes, um, so the question is, in, in the situation of a milka, and the, the bride and the groom, they both agree that they're not going to consummate the marriage, and they're going to live separately. Normally, it wouldn't need any input from the parents from a shara'i perspective. But because of the circumstances of the agreement, if 
they go into that, it involves the parents as well. Because who's going to be providing for her? Her parents. He has to get their buy-in for that. And similarly, um, if his parents are still going to be providing for him, then they have to, they have to give the approval for that. If they do decide to consummate, must the parents be informed? Who's asking? Like, like give, me, give me a specific situation in the sense that must they be informed because the Sharia says so? They must be informed from an honor point of view because it's an agreement that they had. You with me? And, Ya ladina amanu, O fubil ukud. O believers, fulfill your contracts. So if they have an agreement, even though it's an agreement sort of uh, not entirely within the Sharia, but sort of within the Sharia, if you know what I mean. It's like within Nikah, but it's a different agreement. Because they went into that, it would be wrong of them not to, but not sinful. You understand? It's wrong of them not to, because look here, it's not just the two of you. But it's not going to be sinful in the sense that Allah is going to punish them for having consummated the marriage because it's halal you with me that's why i say uh, i'm i'm of the opinion um that they should just get married and come to terms with living arrangements working arrangements supporting arrangements etc but to say no consummation of the marriage i just find that to be a bit strange and um, unnecessary but it's there and uh, some promote it and some regard it as a facility and allah knows best I wouldn't do it. Can you imagine? You, I'm married, but I'm a virgin. I'm married for two years already, but I'm a virgin. How is that? <laughs> yes. They can do anything that the husband and wife can do. <laughs> it's halal. But they agree not to. No V. You know what I mean? <laughs> I wish you said that on the mic. <laughs> and then, and then he does what? With whom? No, of course, that's, that's very bad. So, so I'm not against it. I'm just not a fan of it. I'm not, this is not in any way speaking out against it. It's a facility. If it works for some people, as l my, my role as, a, as an imam or scholar or teacher, whatever you want to call me, is basically to show people how to fulfill Allah's law without displeasing Him. And in, in, in whichever way you can manage to do that, Bismillah, right? There are a million haram ways to do it. There's a few halal ways. Let's figure those ones out and do what's best. That's, that's our objective here. And facilitate the same for our family. And um, it's a sad situation because, yeah, Allah... In the past, this is a joke, but it, it's funny, but it's just tragic, so math, right? In the past, a, a daughter comes home and says, Mommy, Daddy, I'm Hamil. They'll be very disappointed, but they'll have a Thursday night uh, wedding, and the parents' hearts will be shattered. They move on with life. Today, Mommy, Daddy, I'm Hamil. Alhamdulillah, says he a lesbian. <laughs> it's sad, but it's true. It's a strange world. Today I was listening to something, uh, a podcast of sorts. And this person introduced and I was like, what is this? My name is so-and-so. And my pronouns are she and her. What? Are you, are you nuts? <laughs> Your, my pronouns, since when is that normal to say my pronoun? But that's the world we're living in now. So more and more, make marriage easier. Make it easier. Right? My niece, I'm very proud of her, she came out of South Peninsula High School. She matriculated, and like, I think a month or something later, they got married. And uh, the parents agreed um, to the marriage, my brother and, and, and his ex-wife. They agreed. I can't remember what the arrangement was. It was, it, it was started out like a milkah conversation, and they did that, you know, foot in, right? Nikah, finished. <laughs> they got married. And alhamdulillah, they're living a beautiful life, 
right? She's still busy studying. She just finished now, I think. I'm getting your details wrong, but anyway. So now she's getting her feet settled. But the parents made it possible. And others, I, I didn't hear personally because nobody would talk to me about these things, but I'm sure that there were people saying like, how can you do that? She just came out of you know, matric now. And she's, you know, those are the type of things that are poisonous to our society and poisonous to our lives because there's, what good is there in that? And the strange thing is we will bend over backwards to appease those people saying those things. And to the detriment of what? Of Allah's deen. Now, I'm not saying that had my niece not taken that step, that she would have ended up uh, committing haram. Uh, that's, that's not what I'm saying. But you never want to get to that point, right? Somehow we got this, this imagination that, no, not my child, not my child. Look here, are they human? Do they have uh, genitals? Do they have genitals? Do you understand that those genitals function in a certain way? <laughs> it's programmed to do certain things. It's like the north side of a magnet and the south side of a magnet. you telling me that you can put a magnet among other magnets and there's nothing, nothing's going to happen and the magnet's just going to float. There's no... Uh, come on, people. Yeah. Uh, my teacher said this one day and I found it so, like, you know, striking. He said, I still can't believe how parents can come to me and say, Malana, my child committed zina. I don't understand how this happened. You don't understand how this happened. Look, say I'm shocked. Say, um, I, but don't tell me you don't understand how this happened. If they were sitting a whole night, Saturday night, in their room alone, watching whatever, and then you say, I don't understand how this happened. No, we are human. Males want to have sex with females. That's natural. Once you reach puberty, it's your body saying, I'm ready for sexual intercourse. That's biology. If you don't know it, Open up a bio book. That's how it works in the animal kingdom and in, in humans. Yes, we work on a different set of principles, but the Sharia still looks at us as humans. So make things easier. Make things easier. Taib, that's all we have time for. Barakallahu fikum. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, sorry. Let me just end this broadcast quickly. So the, I missed a few questions um, online, but I'll get to it next week, inshallah, I promise. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. There's a dhikr here tomorrow night, inshallah.